आई वी एम वेलकम टू ऑल थिंग्स पॉलिसी अ डेली पॉडकास्ट बाय द तक्षशिला इंस्टीट्यूशन we are a bunch of policy nerds based in bengaluru and we like bringing fresh perspectives to indian affairs and indian perspectives to global affairs so grab a cup of coffee sit back and join us for today's chat hello and welcome to all things policy we've been regularly tracking the covid-19 outbreak for more than a month now and every time we record one of these episodes we only find that the situation has gotten broadly worse to discuss what's happening as of now and what it means for india i have with me nitin and shambhavi shambhavi let's start with you what is happening what is the latest as of today today being tuesday afternoon so as of today uh, 115 countries have been impacted by the corona virus there are more than uh, 114000 cases and more than 4000 deaths so far about 88% of the cases are supposedly in mild condition uh, and 12% are serious or critical in india we had 41 uh, confirmed cases as of yesterday uh, and today that number has gone up by 9 already uh, so we expect more cases to come up soon and i assume these numbers are basically a fraction of the actual number of people who are carrying the disease right right so uh, testing has brutally been low ac- across the globe not a problem just of specific countries uh testing people have run out of testing kits already and people with mild symptoms are been told to stay at home in a lot of countries which means that they are not being tested at all uh so just symptoms of normal flu uh people are staying at home so the actual circulating virus in the globe is probably way higher than what we see nitin what does india have to do so yeah i think this whole business of testing should be taken a lot more seriously so if you look at our healthcare system it's woefully inadequate even given our current disease load so even if there's no new epidemic uh, we are short of hospital beds we are short of doctors we are short of nurses we are short of emergency first responders we are short of almost everything and even if you add both the uh, capacity in the private sector and the government sector we are short of healthcare facilities so the big risk to us is if the numbers become large enough to overwhelm our private and public healthcare you know hospital beds clinics then we are going to get a double whammy or a multiple whammy because there are other life threatening conditions which will get worsened because there isn't enough uh, care given to these people so our risk to us is not just from coronavirus or covid-19 but also from the fact that it is like a distributed denial of service on our uh, healthcare uh, system so we've got to prevent that and to me at least the first and the best defense against the proliferation of the virus in india is testing because if you can test people early enough and test people fast and produce results fast a lot of ensuing actions can be taken which can limit the spread of the disease now it takes about 2 days to come up with the results of a test today yeah, the i think the minimum pace. time is about is a few hours uh, but because of capacity strains i think we are currently at about the 2 day period but a few hours is what the few hours takes. is what the test actually yeah, takes, what the test actually takes. Uh, but uh, you know including shipping yeah. and uh, you know review and, and all of that, that. let's yeah. say it takes about a day now that already means that you know you you have certain constraints on how fast you can do the testing now couple it with the fact that there are only 52 authorized government labs across the country which can do the testing of the 52 i think the condition and the readiness of various labs varies not all of them are of the same level of readiness and efficiency so the niv in pune is the nodal center which ultimately gives you the result which means testing is already a bottleneck i think they might have the test kits for they have already tested 5000 cases plus oh, as of today i suppose they have the capacity to do 10 times as much maybe 50000 60000 tests they can do in short order without uh, running into sh- shortages with respect to the test kits now the test kits are all mostly imported almost always all imported right so you'll start running into uh, shortages of test kits but even at this point right we are not yet in a mood where we are thinking of how do we get additional testing facilities ready uh, now here's one uh, interesting thing currently our re- strategy relies on thermal screening at the airports right so basically there's a temperature sensor and people who have high temperature are screened or people who report that they came from uh, risk areas are screened now this means that uh, you are uh, you know you, you are not really sure how many of them are really covid-19 uh, cases so there are a lot of suspect cases now 
out of you know 10 maybe one might be a covid 19 case but you because you can only suspect today you have to isolate or quarantine the 10 uh, until you are really sure right which means you are adding to the capacity if you could test at the airport right and get a result let's say in 15 minutes then you would be very sure that you know the the person you've tested is a positive case and the rest can actually go home or be surveilled right but of course a 15 minute test is we are far away from a 15 minute test globally but hypothetically the closer you get to a real time testing at the airport the better it is for india because you will be able to reduce the load on the healthcare system to that extent. So that's where we have to move, right? So one of the things, I just wrote a piece in the print today arguing that uh, there are at least a few hundred labs in the country, in the private sector, which can do the testing, right? There are 52 labs accredited to the CAP standard, which is a College of American Pathologists, which is seen as the gold standard in their quality. And another 100 plus uh, who are under the NABL. NABL has thousands of people who are uh, labs which are registered, but let's say you take the top 100 of them. You still have 150 and these are across the country. So I think it's about time that the government says, okay, we are going to allow private labs to test. It's not just the people we refer you to, an ordinary citizen, if he feels, if he or she feels that she has COVID, that she suspects COVID, should be able to go to the lab and get it tested. Just like how you test for malaria and other diseases. That will also bring new cases into the limelight, right? Because currently we don't know what we don't know. But if people can go and test and report that they have COVID, I think we can contain it far better. So this is the current situation. I think the first and the most important thing which needs to be done is to allow private labs to test. Okay. How do we, Shambhavi, scale up this capacity for testing? What's the best way? So as Nathan said, we actually have a moderate amount of capacity. We just have not activated it. Uh, and it's very strange given the fact that two years ago, India contained a Nipah outbreak purely on the basis that a private lab could swoop in, do the testing much before NIV could. Well, not much before, but two days, which actually bought a lot of precious time uh, and saved countless lives just because then the Kerala state government could swing into action, quarantine people uh, and stop it right there. Subsequent to that, uh, there is actually a company in uh, in Bangalore called Big Tech, uh, which made a diagnostic kit for NEPA, which was used in last year's uh, near outbreak. So the diagnosis is pretty immediate. And so they could stop it at one person getting NEPA. It, it never spread. Uh, and so a lot of people don't even know about it. So the capacity is there. We've just not activated it well enough. See, I think it's, this is the question of a national response, right? I think we should look at a national disaster having a national response. Uh, a national response means the government does its job, the private sector does its job, and the civil society does its job, right? Right now, we have a national disaster, but a government response only because both the private sector and the civil society are, you know, very much on the sidelines, right? So I think government must enable this by bringing the resources of the private sector and civil society in, enlist both these social institutions into solving a national disaster, right? Which means, uh, first of all, uh, allowing private tests. Second, uh, allowing R&D in this so that mm-hmm. can we create a fast test kit, right? If the if the capacity exists, why don't we incentivize uh, private labs to actually come up with a test kit which can be used both in India and abroad? Yeah. So testing is one. Uh, the second is actually in terms of healthcare facilities, right? Some of the patients who can afford private healthcare should be able to go to private healthcare, thereby releasing the government re- facilities for uh, other people, right? So there's a lot of things which can be done uh, and I think the thought process has to be can we think of a national response not that the government is solely responsible to uh, deliver the government is responsible to uh, channelize the efforts but it's not the only agency which can deliver there are lots of other agencies which can deliver I think we should think of that also Nathan, like you spoke about the thermal screening right at the airports and the fact that we are picking up people because they have high temperatures who might not all have COVID-19 we are also letting people who might have COVID-19 go away because they might be asymptomatic at the time they are at the airport. And a classic example of the failure that we have seen for this is is the US, which put in thermal screening pretty early on, uh, but now is struggling with the amount of COVID cases they're having. Um, And these people who might develop symptoms later on might feel comfortable also going to a private hospital. So we, we definitely do need more private players in the scheme currently. Yeah, the more the merrier, you know, it's, this is not the time to be saying that you are from X or you are from Y or you belong, you, you are owned by government, you are not owned by government, you are affiliated to this, you are affiliated to that. It's the time when you have to bring all decks on, uh, all hands on deck, right? So all hands on deck, get every possible uh, player who can play a useful role into this and align that person towards a national objective. And at the same time, create us awareness in society that we are in this together. Because we've seen people jumping quarantine, right? We've yeah. seen people not 
declaring it. And it could also be because people don't trust the quarantine facilities, right? People don't trust a government hospital because the mindset is that, you know, this is the place where there are a lot of other viruses and uh, it's not safe for you. So you could expect people to try and jump the quarantine. So uh, it's important that society is also sensitized and buys in. It's not about preaching to society or talking down to society, but enlisting the trust of society in institutions of governance. Yeah. India does seem to be at the moment still in containment mode. And it, though it would occur to me that the sort of thermal screening is going to create lots of false positives, false negatives. You know, people might be coming from Iran or South Korea or or Italy, but they may be actually traveling through a third country. And I don't know if they'll be caught, if those cases will be detected in time. What can India do if containment fails? What is the next step? I think we should not think of that at this point, right? Uh, I think the more important thing right now is to focus on getting travel histories of people and screening it because we are still importing the cases, right? There's no local transmission. So most of the cases that we have are because of people who've traveled from uh, a place where there is, there is a contagion and they've come here. And we've been able to satisfactorily manage it so far, right? And if we do this well and focus on doing this well, I think we'll be able to contain it a lot better. As to what happens if there's a large scale outbreak, you know, that's an entirely different uh, calculation and maybe too early to talk about it at this time. Yeah, I think our current ways of contact tracing seem to be working, at least for now. We, we do not have any secondary infections. Uh, a lot of people have cancelled mass gathering, well, events where there was going to be mass gathering. I was talking to Nitin a couple of days ago about, about Tirupati, the fact that I went there a, a couple of weekends ago. And I was really worried that if a coronavirus patient turns up there, what would happen? They have put in thermal screening now. Uh, so there is, there is awareness. There are things that people are doing. But I think the point of trust is really important. So I was watching this... Uh, uh, news about uh, Harshwadhan going to the airports and he was wearing a mask as he went to the airport to check out the, the thermal screening uh, infrastructure that they had there and the government is at the same time saying please do not wear N95 respirators uh, it's meant only for people who are healthcare workers well that's, he's that's a healthcare a, worker he's, he's a doctor <laughs> with a ministry so I guess <laughs> he's, he's a, a healthcare patient, worker though. There were, there were MLAs from the Maharashtra Assembly, for example, who were, who were out in masks. Uh, and then you're sending out a dual thing that, oh, you don't wear a mask because you know, it's meant for yeah. healthcare workers. But I think that's the thing. The messaging probably has to be tailored for uh, the trust level or the you know local context. Because uh, the message which says don't wear masks unless you really need it might fly in countries which have higher uh, degree of social trust and uh, you know trust on government messaging. In India, it might not work the same way. So maybe some of those messages can be achieved. You just don't talk about those things because people are going to do it anyway, right? People are still going to buy masks and do this anyway. You're saying or not saying might not matter. But people might take you less seriously because you're saying don't wear masks and, you know, going against what people do. It's a hard question because you still have to do it because if you want to save masks for a big epidemic, uh, you know, you want to save it, you have to discourage people wearing masks. But at the same time, saying so might actually cause people to buy more, right? So it's a it's a tough one. What are the other things that the government can do to effectively communicate to people? You know, I always look at public health as an information problem and not a health problem. And the best thing that you could do is have authoritative information put out there uh, in a timely manner, right? To say that there are 43 cases, there are 400 and I don't know how many uh, thousand suspected cases, so many under quarantine. This is the way, uh, for example, this particular uh, case has propagated. I think some other governments I've seen have put charts on the web saying that suspect X met, uh, you know, case one, two, three, four, and that person developed it. So people can actually trace how that transmission happened and therefore protect themselves because and also know that if you're not part of that transmission you're safe right so information timely information which is credible which is authoritative which people can put their trust in i think is a crux of this so but at the same time there's a lot of disinformation misinformation that is that is spreading what can the government actually do about it especially when for example the ayush ministry came out with this uh yeah. with this advisory right about prophylactic uh, measures against the coronavirus and there was no disclaimer that this has been untested or this is just like advice based on what doctors are saying or something like that it just came out and said these are the prophylactic things against against a virus against a completely new virus what can the government actually do yeah see that? i think so far, at least, the government has generally had a very ecumenical, very open, very, I would say, uh, laissez-faire way 
towards medicine. So they'd say, okay, Ayush is there, there's Ayurvedic, there's uh, homeopathy, there's Yunani, there is uh, naturopathy, and there is faith healing. And all of these are treated at the same level uh, as with uh, modern medicine. Now, it's it's a fallacy to believe that there is something called allopathy. There is medicine and there is not medicine. Medicine is anything that can be double blind tested. And anything that cannot be double blind tested and doesn't work the same way for everybody is not medicine, right? So it could come from Ayurvedic. So you could take an Ayurvedic formulation and put it subject to a double blind test. If it works, then it's medicine. It doesn't matter. It came from Ayurveda. It came from a lab in Bangalore or from a lab in New Jersey, sure. right? So the government has been reluctant to understand this and has started, you know, especially with Ayush, which weirdly combines Ayurveda, which is a system of medicine with homeopathy, which is quackery, right? So thereby denigrating Ayurveda. I'm actually surprised that a BJP government, which believes in the Hindu culture and tradition has conflated a system of medicine called Ayurveda, which has a deep tradition with a quackery called homeopathy, which is a German invention, right? Which is, which is weird. But uh, I think what used to be the case is that people were very careful value about this. People were ecumenical. Ye bhi chalta hai, wo bhi chalta hai. But I think the fear of an epidemic uh, will concentrate minds. So all those Ayush advisories which went out a uh, couple of weeks ago, I think they will be stopped now because people know that, you know, people can die. You know, there's a real risk of people dying and the contagion spreading. So you might as well, you know, uh, stop talking about this being to save you. Now, the good thing about those homeopathic uh, medicines is that, you know, it's a viral thing. You can take that medicine. Nothing is going to harm mm-hmm. you. Uh, it's like drinking orange juice. Probably orange juice helps you a little more than those other things, but it's not going to harm you. But the danger was, it was said that this is going to protect you from yeah. getting the virus. Yeah, yeah there Which might is, be a moral hazard to taking it. You know? but there's, there's, just that, a moral hazard. there's yeah. a real hazard, right? Yeah. Because you can believe that, oh, I'm now immune against uh, yeah. coronavirus because I took this homeopathic oh, what was that called uh, arsenic arsenic albumin. arsenic albumin the name itself scared me arsenic but of course homeopathy being what it is I'm sure there's not even a single molecule of arsenic in the whole bottle no, I think it is arsenic I think it's so the yeah, yeah but the homeopathy of, would have diluted it so much there's so yeah, practically yeah. no yeah. molecule yeah. of arsenic in that bottle right yeah. but you know, to claim that it helps you or to protect you from a thing is criminal. Uh, you know, it, it should be treated as a criminal offense that, you know, you're selling a false prospectus in the face of an epidemic. But I think those will stop or they'll at least be held down for a period of time. If mm-hmm. governments don't do that, they are culpable. If governments continue to peddle fake remedies uh, saying that this will protect you from coronavirus, they are culpable. Yeah, I think it is similar to saying that paracetamol will protect you from not not the arsenic one, at least the Ayurveda thing, the other things that they have said is, is more like saying you take paracetamol Tomorrow you will not get coronavirus. Yeah. That's the allopathic equivalent of. Yeah, so basically an epidemic is not the time when we can afford non-science. <laughs> epidemic is a time when you have to put your faith in double-blind empirical evidence and practice modern medicine for your lives. Yeah, maybe there are no uh, homeopathy believers in, in a time of a pandemic. But we've also seen schools, for instance, close down. Is this a wise measure, Shambhavi? So children by themselves seem to have lesser mortality rates. They are still at risk to similar levels as adults, but uh, they seem to cope better with the infection. What, what that means is that they are better carriers, I guess. So if a child gets infected at school, everybody else gets infected at school, all of, everyone's parents get infected at school. So in a way, it makes sense, but it's still not a priority uh, population, I think, target population. Uh, how does India handle the economic impact of just trying to contain this? No, let me just talk yeah, about yeah, the schools. Yeah, I wanted for to ask Nitin ah. about... Uh, what the parents feel about no, see, schools. I think the, uh, there is some empirical evidence to show that uh, closing down schools will reduce the intensity of the outbreak. Because this guy Kucharski in his book, The Rules of Contagion, talks about the 2009 influenza pandemic in the UK, where there were two peaks of the epidemic in the UK, both coinciding with the opening of the schools. And the moment the schools shut down for the holidays, the cases came down immediately. right? Because what's happening is basically sc- schools are mixing uh, places, right? Kids from different communities come together uh, apartment blocks, uh, areas of the city come together and then mixing happens and they go back home and then they, they can take the, the disease. So even if the kids themselves are not affected, they might carry the uh, the virus to their parents and other c- communities. So there is some grounds to uh, block it. While this might work in the UK, whether it works this, to the same extent in other parts of the world is remains to be uh, seen, right? Now, one of the things which immediately happens when you get the kids to be uh, off school is that who takes care of them? So the parents will have to stay at home. Right, which in a way might work to your advantage because now the parents are not exposing themselves to workplaces. Right, so at least one parent, let's say, doesn't go to work. 
you are reducing the chances of exposure by 50% because one parent is not going rather parent is going but it has an economic cost right it also has a social cost because it has a gender dimension because if the mother has to take uh, stay at home then the mother's career suffers right so there are all those other dimensions out there but in an emergency in a pinch uh, getting the kids off from school and uh, staying at home is i think a good idea my son enjoys it the moment the schools were closed yesterday he was on the roof for the last for 2 hours continuously that his exams were cancelled and he was like totally overjoyed so well let if the kids can enjoy it then why not and what about companies how do workplaces handle this see the sars epidemic told us that you can do a lot of things remotely right most companies today can uh, especially in the services industry can operate from home right people can work from home you can do their work from home they can have meetings on skype and zoom and other things uh, they can use flock and slack and other things so like for example the tools that we use at takshashila for our teaching so uh, incidentally i see a lot of colleges and universities trying to move online and we've been doing it for the last 8 years and we know exactly how to do this yes. and it works fantastic right? so you can do things online you might not be able to do this in retail you might not be able to do that in restaurants in manufacturing and other things where i think the uh, big crunch will be right but well, services industry can actually function online uh, with without that much of a downtime now i just want to step back and look at the international situation as of today the who hasn't called this a pandemic they say we're close to a pandemic are they doing the right thing you know i think it's a tough call to make uh, at any time but somehow this particular time i felt that the who was more sensitive to the geopolitics sensitivity to chinese politics than its main job because i remember a couple of months ago when it first started writing an article saying that you know the united states and others have taken drastic measures but the who has advised against those things what does the us know that we, we don't know or what does the us know that the who is not accepting because it can't be that the us is going to uh, drastic measures in terms of travel bans if they don't have a assessment of the risk right so i don't know whether the who has has been more inclined to declare uh, and inform the public about the risks rather than be cautious and to avoid either being insensitive to the chinese government or uh, creating panic right even for example this conversation which we i mean the thing which you just mentioned uh, that uh, we are close to a pandemic i mean you're <laughs> close to a pandemic you would create as much panic as saying we are in a pandemic so you might as well say we are in a pandemic let the legal regime move to a pandemic situation and let companies and countries take measures which they need to in a pandemic because if you say we are close to a pandemic you know countries and companies are left to their own devices how do you decide what is close to a pandemic what do you do right so i think the who should have been and should be a lot more forthright in communicating information than they have been so far so these terms like pandemic outbreak epidemic are a very poorly defined extremely fluid terms for example cnn yesterday came out and said that we are calling this a pandemic we are not going to wait for the who to say because in our eyes this is a pandemic we don't know what how much worse did it have to get before we call it a pandemic so it has spread to 115 countries uh, there there is the diamond princess outside of japan and then there is this cruise now in california with coronavirus patients and so yeah i think if this is not a pandemic i really don't know what is yeah there's a figure in the atlantic that claims that iran could be understating the number of cases by a factor of 250 so yeah that's that might be the scale of what we're dealing with yeah italy has closed it's a down the whole country of italy has country. been shut down can you imagine that right and if this is not a pandemic what is it <laughs> well on that somber note uh, thanks for joining us today uh, nitin and shambhavi and we'll keep giving you more updates about the coronavirus uh, as it progresses thank you very much if you liked our show don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the ivm network you can tune into them on the ivm podcast app ivmpodcast.com or wherever you listen to your podcasts you can also follow ivm on social media the handle is at ivm podcasts on twitter facebook and instagram and hey if you'd like to dive into takshashila's research on technology strategy and economic affairs check us out at our twitter handle at takshashila inst or our website takshashila.org.in I hope you enjoyed that show. We'd like to thank our sponsors this week, HDFC Life and Paytm Money. 
Also, just a very quick note, I would really appreciate it if you guys could fill out a really short survey on our website. It's on ivmpodcast.com slash survey. It's just a brand recognition survey for us to kind of work with the advertisers and give them some data. So it's a very short, less than one minute survey. Really appreciate your help in filling it out. And let me tell you a couple of things that you should check out this week. On paperback, Rachita and Satyajit are joined by the host of Lit Nama, Lakshmi Krishnan. They talk about women's role in writing and fiction written by women. On The Habit Coach, we have a Women's Day special where Ashton talks about periods, PMS, PCOD, and other taboo subjects which shouldn't be taboo at all. On The Empowering Series, Zarina is joined by actor Jim Sarb. They talk about the art of storytelling and his unconventional characters. On Agla Station Adulthood, Aishi and Ritasha talk about coming of rage and coming of age. On IVM Life, Ritika Alika and Antaresh welcome new producer at IVM Sumit to discuss their ultimate fantasy jobs. Don't miss Sumit's first ever recommendation on the show. Thanks and keep listening. Welcome to Peak Planet, a new podcast where we delve into the fallouts of the growth path that we and indeed much of the world has chosen. Sustainable growth is the buzzword. Until we nail that down, we need to ensure that we keep our population healthy and also have the resources for our increasingly urban lifestyles. I'm Karthik Ganesan, a researcher at the Council on Energy, Environment and Water, a Delhi-based policy research institute where for almost a decade we've been trying to explain and change the use, reuse and misuse of our resources. In the first season of Peak Planet, we take up air pollution, public enemy number one and an invisible one at that. Increasingly, the most important risk factor for adverse health outcomes, air pollution has become the most unwanted byproduct for an aggressively growing economy. Over four episodes, we find out how prepared our systems are to deal with this crisis. You can catch the entire first season of Peak Planet out now on the IVM Podcasts app or website or wherever you get your podcast from.